Hello, hello, hello world, hello internet, happy Tuesday. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Thank you for joining us here at uh, Coded Live. I'm uh, your host, Sam Basu, and with me, I have your other co-host that you see all through the week, Mr. Ed Sherbino. How are you, sir? Hello, everybody. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me today, Ed. I kind of dragged Ed into this, so I'll, uh, we'll walk over why we're doing this. But this is a special stream. This is uh, us uh, supporting uh, the Worthy Web Hackathon. Uh, so speaking of which, let me um, bring up my desktop so we could talk through it. There you go. All right, folks. So uh, we are doing a hackathon. Um, we are still living through a pandemic, so we are doing a completely virtual hackathon where everybody um, from all around the globe, you can participate, right? So um, uh, we can uh, post a link to this. Uh, let me bring up uh, our comments here so I can look at uh, whatever else you're saying and if we, can, we want to post anything. So uh, take a look at this. And Ed, if you uh, have the link handy, go ahead and uh, post it. But this is our Worthy Web App Challenge. Essentially, we are challenging you over a month and a half uh, to go do something uh, worthy, go do some good with your web skills. And uh, we have a lot of prizes to go away at the end of it uh, using some of the best UI components you might um, want to use for Blazor, uh, for React, for Angular. So we don't want to hold back your hands. Uh, do however you want to build your app. And uh, this maybe is the little place where I come in for mobile support. So just for context, um, I, am, I, I live in native land. <laughs> I, I do desktop and mobile, and I, I'm also a realist. I understand all of you like doing the web stuff. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, using your web technologies, using your web skills, and bring them, bringing them over to build apps the right way, where you're using web stuff, but just not for the browser. And I brought Ed, Ed along just so he can heckle me all through uh, while we talk about uh, mobile support, because there, there is quite a bit you can actually do with mobile and desktop as well. Uh, but um, we posted the link, uh, folks. So that is um, uh, the homepage for all the Worthy Web uh, Hackathon Challenge. You can look at the eligibility requirements and some really cool uh, people judging your uh, apps at the end. And uh, this is kind of what we are doing uh, all through uh, kind of the month and a half, from April 6th to May, May 25th. Uh, we want to be there with you uh, uh, in your journey. And we're going to be doing a lot of things that uh, you are uh, going to be needing to do in your apps anyway. So we are uh, doing a series of shows where we kind of help you out. So I think we did two of them already. We did a, a Kinder React show. We did, uh, Ed brought on Chris DeMars, who's a good friend of ours, to talk about semantic HTML and accessibility. This is today. Uh, we are talking about uh, hitting mobile form factors with web stuff. And we got uh, a lot more shows lined up um, all through the hackathon. Um, Alyssa is going to come on next, and TJ, and Ed, and Marin. So um, oh, we have a mystery stream, which I have actually no idea what that is. And then I will, I will close things off uh, towards the end, talking about accessibility again for mobile form factors. So um, Ed, uh, what's been your experience so far with the Worthy Web shows? You having fun? Yeah, it was great having uh, Chris DeMars on. We talked about uh, all sorts of semantic HTML stuff that uh, non-HTML nerds might not have known. So we dug in pretty deep on that one. I think it turned out really well. Cool. All right, so um, let's let's start today. So the whole goal is um, you, you are invested into web stuff. And I'm, I'm not going to try to pull you back because uh, you love your web, and that's fine. Ed is here to help. <laughs> What I do want to do is show you that uh, all of that web stuff can actually power nice experiences on mobile form factors. And it's it's 2021. So if you are not aiming to um, target mobile form factors, you're missing out on a big chunk of your audience. Or maybe they're not having the right user experience if you're not thinking through um, the mobile experience. So that's what we're here to do. Um, let's start maybe with um, something that's a little uh, offbeat. It's not maybe quite production ready yet, but it's like super fun, uh, especially as it evolves into production readiness by the end of this year uh, in November with, uh, with .NET 6. So let's talk about some like really uh, cutting edge stuff first, but then we'll talk about more of the reality of building like progressive web apps. And um, Ed has a lot of things he can show you. Uh, we can talk to a lot of the strategies that you can do. So um, let's start with uh, Blazor, right? Because again, everyone's excited about Blazor. We have the Blazor King right here with us. So 
Ed, uh, while I bring things up, uh, give us like a 10,000 feet. What is Blazor and where are things now? Uh, so if you're joining us right now, you've probably heard a little bit about Blazor. If uh, you haven't, then you're probably from a JavaScript ecosystem like React or Angular. So Blazor is very similar to React or Angular, except it uses all .NET tech to do web development. And you can create SPA applications and PWAs. Uh, and it works uh, very similarly to those um, JavaScript frameworks that you have. But uh, all the tooling is in .NET. So you're, if you're a .NET developer, then you're in a very familiar ecosystem with all of your NuGet packages and build system and Visual Studio and all the tooling in there. And um, it's, uh, it's a really highly productive um, uh, framework for building web applications. Indeed. And like you said, like the best part is this is C sharp here. This is in your ballpark with .NET, with Visual Studio and everything that you know and love. And it's C sharp front and back, server side mm -hmm. and, and client side. So what I want to start out talking about is what's cooking right now and what will be production ready by November. So I pulled up uh, a post here, which is .NET 6 preview one. This was back in February. So .NET 6 is coming in November of 2021. And you can already see they're working towards some of the goals. They they want to bring Blazor out of just the web and into mobile form factors, into desktop. So uh, a lot of it is going to be powered by uh, .NET MAUI, which is the multi-platform app UI, which is what Xamarin Forms is kind of evolving into. And that's going to power a lot of things, um, bringing Blazor into desktop and mobile. So take a look at this. You can see some of the things we are showing right now. I mean, .NET 6 works fine on uh, iOS and Android, and of course, Blazor. Um, this is going to be the same code that we're going to look at that runs on iOS and Android. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to show you what you can do right now and then what you will be able to do um, uh, in the near future. And again, this is a hackathon, so you are more than welcome to use this to add some mobile support uh, to your web app, right? So uh, do a search on uh, mobile Blazor bindings. That's the one I want to show you. And this is evolving because there are two uh, kind of nuances to this, and they are both kind of really fun because uh, you could build absolutely real native apps with Blazor, and you can also do hybrid apps where you're mixing and matching some Blazor stuff with some native stuff, so it's it's kind of exciting. So right now, this if you uh, take a look at this, it's it's kind of bootstrapping things based on Xamarin Forms, but it's evolving. They're working on this as we speak to using .NET MAUI. So the runtime and the framework underneath that is evolving a little bit. So start here, and uh, it'll show you a lot of things that I am about to cover. But let's take a quick look as to what this entails. So this is preview, so it doesn't have. Visual Studio file new support yet, but it does have CLI tools, uh, which uh, should not be something we shy away from anymore, .NET developers. So uh, they give you a template, a couple of templates actually to start off. So let me start this up in my terminal. And I'm gonna bump up the fonts here, make sure you can all see. All right. Ed and me are both getting old, so we make sure we can see things Ed, let me know if you need me to pump anything up. All right, so I, I do have .NET here on my machine. So when I do a .NET new, it's essentially saying, hey, this is file new project. These are the things I can do, and it's, it's a lot. I mean, look at that. Mac Catalyst is right there. iOS is right there. So now you can do .NET new iOS if you're doing native stuff, or like that's essentially Xamarin iOS and Xamarin.Mac are now native into .NET. And then you get a bunch of Blazor stuff, obviously, uh, which is all your Blazor server side, Blazor WebAssembly. Uh, but then you get a couple more things, which I already have installed these templates. If you don't, if you don't see these two things, then just go ahead and install that template, which is right here. .NET new uh, dash I install mobile Blazor bindings. That's the name of the template. So when you install that template, you get these two things. One is mobile Blazor bindings, and then you have you have Blazor hybrid. So what do these things do essentially? So let's go in here and maybe look at uh, building your first app. And we're going to do exactly what they're saying. We can start with mobile Blazor bindings, and then I'm going to show you two nuances of this. Okay. So let's uh, go over into uh, a folder where I like to keep my stuff and let's do clear. All right, so now let's copy and paste because that's how we like professional developers like getting stuff done. So we're going to do a .NET new mobile Blazor bindings. 
let's change the output folder name here. So let's call this Word V Web uh, Native. How about that? And we fire away. The template essentially is going to um, uh, throw out uh, a project, and that's essentially all you need. So if I go look now in my directories, you are going to see, let me see where it was, CLI projects. Um, so Word the Web native right there. See that? So I'm going to pull this up. And Ed is furiously typing away on his clickety-click keyboards. It's all good. Sorry, I'll, I'll mute. I was trying to get a message out to somebody <laughs> no, it's, here. It's comforting to know that you're replying to emails while on stream. No worries. No, it's actually... I'm trying to pull up some tooling for my part of the stream and it's not uh, doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah, well, well, we'll do it live. Okay, so it created a solution for me. And if I look at the bits here, so it did a Word the Web native and then it did an iOS and an Android, right? So what exactly is this thing? Now, I don't have all of the latest uh, Android um, bits here, so uh, bear with me and as I make um, iOS my startup project, and I'm just going to remove the Android one because like, we're not doing anything native stuff here. So I'll just run it uh, on iOS and it's the same on, on Android. So it just makes it a cleaner project. So so now I have uh, a Word the Web native project and an iOS project. And it's saying, hey, I don't know your configuration. So let's see if I can fix that um, project uh, configuration iPhone simulator. There you go. No, I don't want an iPod touch. Give me iPhone 11. I still have an iPhone 11. Okay, there you go. So let's do a build and we'll look at um, what exactly this did for us. Because all we did was a .NET new and we spun up a project. Let's see what it did. Where, where is Blazor coming into this? So it's building and it's the first time. So it's going to pull down some of its dependencies. Almost done. So while it's building, Ed, um, have you uh, seen Blazor mobile bindings? And what are your feelings as a Blazor aficionado? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting that you can take the Blazor framework and switch out the rendering engine for it, which is what they're doing here. So yeah. they've taken the HTML DOM and swapped it with one that's created through uh, Xamarin Forms. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that shows off the flexibility of the framework. I myself am a little bit more interested in what they're doing with the web, uh, Blazor yeah. WebView component. The hybrid, yes, yes. Yeah, the hybrid so we, apps. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get to that. But right off the gate, like you see, like this is our .NET standard library. This is our iOS project, so this has uh, the look and feel of Xamarin Forms, which is because what it is, right? So if I go look into my uh, iOS project here, and I'm not going to touch anything in my iOS or Android projects, but right off the gate, you see the app delegate. Uh, this is very typical Xamarin Forms. We are doing Xamarin Forms in it, and then we are loading up the application. We are newing up it, uh, newing it up, and that's it. And that's all we are doing. So essentially, this is uh, Xamarin Forms. But what is different here is. Laser Mobile Bindings is actually using what um, Xamarin Forms is evolving into because this is not how a Xamarin Form app uh, bootstraps itself. It's it's different. Um, but again, this will be the uh, the host builder configuration model that .NET MAUI will end up using. But this is using again. If you're coming from an ASP.NET or a Blazor background, this should uh, kind of look very familiar. All we are doing is we are setting the new main page, which is the first page of the application, to the content page, and we are newing up a new component and adding that hello world as a component. And that hello world razor is right here. So let me go ahead and run this uh, real quick so you see what this looks like. So I'm already on a Mac. It knows how to do a build and. Uh, grab the iOS simulator. If you were doing it on Windows, you, I mean, to get, I mean, this is still a native app. This is absolutely native. There is no web play here. Uh, so you will need some sort of a Mac to go do the build if you are on a, on, on a Windows machine. You can go to Mac in the cloud or uh, some Visual Studio services that will do the build for you. But you do need some sort of a Mac and Android. You will you will have have it easy. So this one here is just an increment button here. You click that any number of times it goes up, right? So in this app, there is actually nothing web. This is all 
uh, native stuff. All we are using is the Blazor syntax. And again, if you are coming from a Blazor background, maybe you can share some code. You can uh, share some of the things that you, that you already have. So the way this is working is... So you can yeah. share anything that is logical. Uh, exactly. So C, any C-sharp code, uh, yeah. any logic you can pull out of your component and put into C, a C-sharp file, but you can't share any the UI. Yep, exactly. So this is the markup uh, that's actually driving it. So what you see here is uh, kind of HTML-ish maybe, but this is actually uh, borderline XAML because it's lifting some of the pieces that XAML Forms developers do. So the content view, that's essentially the type of page this is. The stack layout, that's how we stack our controls uh, horizontally or vertically. And then we have a label, uh, which is saying hello world. Now this counter, now to Ed's point, like what can you share between a Blazor app? Like that's a component, you can share a component. So that counter is essentially something we are just dropping in here. And that counter is a Razor file, which is essentially this one is using a stack and a button. Again, these are all native things. All that we are doing here is the Blazor syntax, the Razor syntax, essentially. Uh, this code view looks a little uh, similar if you are coming from Blazor. And that's all. This is all native play. We are essentially using the Blazor syntax to go render the corresponding button, the corresponding label, and the stack layout on top of Xamarin Forms. So now, hopefully this Sam, makes sense. You could, yeah. you could take those code blocks out too and put them in a code behind file. You could, yeah, you absolutely could. And uh, this is something Ed keeps telling me, you should not, uh, like this is what we learned from like web forms, right? So this is spaghetti code. You're mixing and matching your markup with your code behind or logic. So don't do that. Uh, separate this off into a razor.cs file and make it a, a I think it's a, a partial class is all that you need to do. And then it's then it's a code behind. So yeah. and, uh, another thing you could do with this, um, this type of uh, code sharing idea is uh, with the um, the Blazor mobile bindings and the web version of Blazor, uh, people ask me all the time about MVVM. You know, is that something you use with any of these things? And I generally say no, uh, because Blazor has its own kind of MVP type of a pattern uh, to it. However, if you're going to be code sharing between um, two code bases and one is using Blazor mobile bindings and one is using Blazor web, then MVVM might actually be a really good solution for sharing the the uh, code between the two, uh, because of that uh, MVVM pattern, you're going to abstract away a lot of the code that you can share. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is one way, folks, where if you want to do Blazor, if you are not OK learning the XAML way of doing XAML forms, then you can write almost Blazor-ish Blazor code, uh, and, and it'll render native stuff. So there is no web play. This is not WebAssembly. This is purely using the Blazor syntax. So this was step one, OK? Uh, so let, let's go ahead and close this. And we will do another app, um, which is a slightly different nuance to this. And that's what Ed was pointing out. So this is what's called the hybrid app. And this is actually a little bit more enticing if you are a Blazor uh, developer. So we're going to do this here. We're going to copy this out and um, step maybe out of this. Now, let me see. Where am I? Oh, I guess that all the way out. So let's go back in here. And now we can do this .NET new Blazor hybrid as compared to Blazor uh, mobile bindings. And let's give it a different name here. So worthy web hybrid, OK? So that's just output folder name, and it's done. And actually, I can close off uh, my CLI tool. I don't need that anymore. Because uh, all I needed was um, this project being spit out. And now you see a lot more actually happening here. You see Windows, you see Mac, and you see iOS and Android. So what is going on? And, and this is kind of fun. This is kind of what will evolve a lot more once uh, .NET 6 is out of the mm -hmm. gate. And um, this is exciting, actually. November is going to look really nice with this. Yes, 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 yes. So right out of the gate, when I open the solution, Visual Studio is going to get all confused because it does not know how to run a Windows project because I'm on a Mac. So I will do a little bit of cleanup. Uh, see, it says, I cannot even restore your project. So that's fine. <laughs> uh, let's make iOS our startup project. Let's get rid of Android. Sure. Let's get rid of Android. Yeah. I'm not an Android fan, but I know. 
I know. Um, How dare def you? Definitely the Windows one. Because again, like um, if you are doing uh, this on Windows, then get rid of the Mac one, obviously, because uh, you can't run it. Um, but essentially what it's doing, it's using Xamarin Forms, but it's using the web, uh, the, 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 the WPF renderers to reach Windows and then the Mac renderers to reach uh, the Mac. Uh, Mac OS. Okay, so now this should be good. Uh, now we are uh, on Mac land. We have iOS and Mac OS, which is good. So let me change the configuration again. So okay. my, my daughter is a huge uh, Mac fan or was. Hmm. And uh, was? Oh, I yeah. finally I finally convinced her uh, that a an Android phone was the way to go because of cost. It was a lot cheaper to get an Android phone. And she, she had it for about a week and she's like, oh, I hate this thing. And then she found a mod that turns it to look exactly like a, uh. like a, like <laughs> iOS. And she installed the mod Dude. and she's like, I don't know why anybody would pay, you know, $900 for an iPhone. Uh, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> she's been converted, Sam. Yeah. Whatever floats your boat. Um, <laughs> she's like, this was free and the phone was 200 bucks. <laughs> I, I hear you. Cheapness prevails. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> no, for sure. Okay, so Visual Studio is also having a day of Tuesdays. So let me do one build at a time. Oh, no, it doesn't build the common solution. Okay, well, go ahead and restore the Nougat packages. I wanted you to restore, and you wouldn't restore. So Chat's quiet. We've got a little yeah. Apple versus Mac dialogue going here in, in the show, and in chats quiet is quiet can be uh how about pineapple and pizza anybody want in on that i'm good with pineapples anywhere <laughs> it's okay, funny because people usually won't comment until you throw something like that out there and then then people <laughs> have an opinion of course see as, as developers like we are um oh no now it's really complaining okay all right <laughs> Why are you so angry at me? All right, how about the classic thing? Like I close it and I bring it back up. Yeah, that'll fix it. If not, I, I got other projects to go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> no pineapple. So no, it's no, uh, the, the, the <laughs> consensus so far is uh, pineapple is bad. Android is good. <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah. go with that. So um, Ed, while I'm doing it, feel free to um, bring out some of the messages and highlight them. Yeah, nothing wrong with Android. It's just uh, whatever suits your taste. Apple is kind of a closed ecosystem. Ed and me were just talking about it before we went live. Like things just work better when you are in a walled garden. But as long as you sign up to be in that walled garden, so and yeah. If the if the Kool Aid tastes good over there, I still drink it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so okay, so see now it works. This, this, so this is will, the bleeding edge scenario where uh, yeah yeah it, it's, it's, it's gonna creepy. hurt a little bit it's, yeah but it's it's super fun to go into and as like developers you are much more comfortable when you your stuff breaks and you and you know why it's breaking as compared to when something works and you don't know why it's working so I have no idea why Visual Studio said I can't build it but now it builds it again all right. So let's run this again, and this will look a little different. I do not like an iPod Touch. Why? I'm not sure why it keeps bringing on the iPod Touch as my primary device to go to. So let's start building this or deploying it and see if it works out. We haven't looked at any of this code yet. Yeah. Will this run on my Zoom? Oh, why? Uh, I miss my Windows phone and my Zoom as well. Uh, there's something beautiful about that UI and the UX. Yeah. OK. So now we have um, Blazor back on mobile. Um, so uh, SD Liebman, I am not um, crapping on Android here. This will work just fine on Android. I, I wish I had not deleted the Android project, but there's no platform specific thing with it. It'll work everywhere. OK, so this is a mix and match, right? This is uh, some native and some hybrid mixed together, right? So mm -hmm. this, uh, this hello world text and the increment counter, when I do that, um, see that uh, that goes up. That's all native. But then everything down below, when you see the Blazor look and feel, that's all web, right? This looks very familiar. Um, the counter is actually being shared, right? This is a component, right? So this is being shared, um, so I can move it up. The good thing is we are now sharing code between native and hybrid. So how is this working? 
Um, if I take a close look here on the iOS project and Android will do the same thing, we do still see Xamarin Forms. If I look at the app delegate project here, we are still doing Xamarin Forms you know, right here, uh, for xamarinforms.init. So expect this part to change once uh, .NET MAUI is ready and they're working on it. It's just not ready yet. Um, but what is interesting is if I look back in my common project, which is the Word the Web hybrid project, um, you have this folder called Web UI. So the idea is if you have a Blazor application, you should be able to just copy and paste, grab that whole folder, just bring it over and just drop it here and it should light up because we are essentially hosting a Blazor application inside of a web view. Now, this is not Electron, so we're not shipping Node.js or Chromium we are literally hosting it inside of a web view and it's smart. Uh, so when I run it on iOS, this is actually using the WK web view uh, on iOS and on Windows, or if I run it on Windows um, or, um, yeah, I, I suppose on Windows, then it's going to use the web view too. Uh, and on Android, I think it uses the latest Chromium based uh, browser. So and in all circumstances, it's running the .NET framework and not WebAssembly. Exactly. This is not WebAssembly. So if I look at the main.razor uh, file here, which is how the app is starting up, which is, I mean, app.cs still kind of gives you that bootstrapping thing. You have the host builder and we are saying, hey, main page is going to be this component called hello world main page. And that's it. That's all we need to do. Then you look at this piece of markup here. Everything that you see here all the way the content view, the stack layout. This looks kind of similar to what we just did with uh, Blazor uh, native. But here you have this thing called Blazor web view, which is rendering the corresponding web view and hosting your app in it. And all we are doing is go host this app called that's that's aimed at webui.app. So that's your entire web app. Uh, that's right here. So in your web UI, you have your pages, you have your imports and your app.razor, everything that you like and love about Blazor, it is right here. So if I take a quick look here, uh, I mean, the, this this will look familiar, the nav menu, the survey prompts uh, in Blazor. If I look at the index.razor page here, this is straight up Blazor, right? And it's just being hosted within that web view. Uh, the counter.razor, this is again using that counter, which is common, the counter state here, which keeps the counters in sync between web and uh, native uh, or native and hybrid. That is because it's sharing that counter component between web and, and hybrid. So this is a different way of doing things in which uh, your Blazor code is a lot more, like you, you feel a lot more comfortable because you're not rendering native stuff. You're literally writing Blazor as you would expect. Um, so this is Blazor running native and hybrid on your mobile devices. So um, Ed, you like this, right? Yeah, this is, uh, I think this is a great migration strategy. It's a really yeah. good way to cover all your bases. Uh, the way the Blazor handles routing, I think, is just absolutely elegant. Uh, that's one of the reasons you're able to do this. Uh, any of these, quote, shells is, uh, they're, they're able to pick up the routing from the individual components themselves, mm -hmm. whereas like something like MVC or uh, any of those other frameworks that you've used in the past, like routing is usually like stored in one area of the app or it's it's done through some sort of magic with like file uh, folder names. Uh, I like the component directives that, that control all this because you could put all of your stuff in a shared library and then the consumers of that library pick up the routing automatically. This is really, yeah. really yeah. handy. Exactly. And all of your routing, all of your components, just bring them over as you have it in your Blazor component and just wrap it inside uh, this web UI folder and, and you have it. Uh, it'll just render on top of the web view. So this is real elegant. Uh, like I said, right now it is still using Xamarin Forms, but expect that to change. But this is a great way for you to share code between your Blazor applications and being able to um, target mobile form factors, right? So take a look at this uh, again for the hackathon. Like this might be all you need to do to just kind of share some code and show it working on mobile devices. Because again, if you are not targeting mobile devices, like especially in some parts of the world, like you're losing out on a big chunk of your audience. So um, yeah, let's let's target the web or, or let's target mobile with web. Okay, so let's uh, let's close this and um, let's start something new. So we are like half an hour into this. Uh, I did want to show you the native and the hybrid stuff before we get back into 
the things that uh, you might most commonly do. That's a progressive web app. So let me show you this, and then uh, I will let uh, Ed kind of chime in as well. So let's say you are starting a greenfield thing for the hackathon, or maybe uh, something you're working on in your Visual Studio. And this is the same on Visual Studio for Windows as well. I can pick uh, the web stuff, and then I see all of this stuff, which is our web applications uh, using Razor Pages, web application using MVC, and then you have the Blazor server model, Blazor WebAssembly, Angular, React. So again. Do what you need to do uh, to build. Um, oh, hey, Ancient Coder is here. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so do what you feel like. Uh, we are talking Blazor here, but uh, some of the techniques uh, for building a PWA, those apply the same if you are choosing React or Angular. It's about the same. Um, but let me uh, let me pick uh, maybe a Blazor WebAssembly thing here. I'm squarely now in Ed's territory, which is fine. Uh, but right now, you can see .NET Core 3.1, which is fine. Uh, I don't care about authentication. But this right here, so you can have this ASP.NET Core hosted as a, as a backend, but this is enticing, just one check mark. Now, you don't have to start with this. If you already have a project, you can make it a PWA. But let's just assume you are starting Before fresh. Before you click next, Sam, okay, .NET 5. Well, Use .NET 5, my friend. .NET 5? All right. All yeah, right. I, I wouldn't recommend uh, .NET Core 3.1 to anybody that's starting a new project. <laughs> uh, .NET 5 is has massive in, uh, performance improvements over 3.1. Yeah. Uh, so I'd, I would always start with .NET 5. All right, all right. You you don't want me to go .NET 6 yet, right? It's, it's no, .NET 6 is not ready. <laughs> Once it is, though, it's, I would recommend previous, it over .NET yeah, 5. Yeah. .NET 3.1 so, is good because it's an LTS uh, release, but yeah. uh, the trade-offs for performance, you're, you're going to get a .NET 5. .NET True. 5 is my definite recommendation. True. And .NET 6 is sitting on preview 3 right now, so they're doing they're going to do like one preview every month uh, until November. So expect like three or four more previews. So let's say Word the Web. So we did a Word the Web native. We did a Word the Web hybrid. Now let's call it a PWA. So this is what you get out of the box, right? And and while while it's spinning up, let me show you a, a blog post that I stumbled across. Um, if I can find it, I think I had it bookmarked. Yeah. So this is straight up on ASP.NET Core documentation, right? Uh, and and Blazor documentation. If you started a, a Blazor project and you do not have a PWA, then it's fairly easy to add this back in. So this is what we did. We checked that box. We said progressive web app. But you, if you had an existing Blazor WebAssembly, you can convert that into a PWA. So what they're doing is they're adding a manifest. And, and so let me let me show you this. Actually, this is something I am fond of. So uh, Microsoft uh, drives a project, uh, which is actually supported heavily by the community. It's called PWA Builder. Now, it's there are lots tool. of things. It is a fantastic tool. Like, I mean, there's Lighthouse. There is lots of different tools for you to build a PWA. But let's talk about what, what exactly are we building. So a PWA is meant to be a fast web app that's a very good citizen. On your mobile device, you are supposed to have a manifest file that declares to the web browser that, hey, I can do these things. These are my capabilities. I have, I have some icons. People can pin me to their home screen, which is like precious real estate. Uh, and then you have service workers, which are mostly JavaScript files that run in the background and do stuff for you, right? So this is a great tool if you like, technically every website can be a PWA, but it in reality, it should not because like you should really care about the experience you're providing offline support and so on. So you can start from scratch. They have a PWA starter, but uh, here I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make a joke of myself. I'm going to pick um, my blog, which I actually do not update all that much. I should get back to it. But um, here I'm going to post my URL. Uh, and this is not a PWA. So when I start, it's going to go look for stuff and it's not going to find anything and it's going to give you some help. Um, so it's doing a test and it's going to complain and say, hey, you don't have a web manifest, you don't have icons, you don't have all of these things, and then you don't have a service worker. So right from here, you can start and you can say, okay, give me a service worker, and then it's going to generate a file for you and then you can embed that and, and start. So I just want to point this out. Like um, if you had, uh, a React or an Angular app, and if you weren't sure, like, uh, am I doing all the things that a PWA needs me to do? This is your way. And uh, like mobile support is a category for you to win on, on the hackathon. So it's fairly easy to just add some mobile support mm -hmm. to it. So Ed, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I've used this before um, for a project that will go unnamed, but <laughs> it, it helped a lot. Uh, 
I was building a PWA for um, a demo that I needed to complete, and um, I had to kind of mash up three different technologies that were all brand new, and uh, that analyzer helped fix a lot of my problems. Yep. Yep. So um, again, on the ASP.NET Core uh, on the Blazor docs, they kind of walk you through, like um, use that uh, CLI tool. And then these are the things you drop in, like icons, manifest.json, service workers, and then off you go. So let's take a look at what Visual Studio did for us out of the box. Um, looks like it's done. Now, this should be a straight up Blazor project, but it should have the basics of doing the PWA. So let me see if I can build it and run it. Let's do a build first. That's a really just... good question here, Sam. Um, is it safe to install .NET 6 along with .NET 5 on a production desktop? Yes, yes, yes. You're, you're yeah. totally fine. Uh, Absolutely. So let, me... Uh, yeah. let me add to that, though. Um, you want to set up a uh, global.json file. And what global.json does is it specifies what uh, version of .NET is used in the path that you're on. So what you can do is you can set up, uh, say you're at, at work, and uh, you have, you know this is your production dev machine. You can set up a um, a folder tree for all of your production applications that are running in .NET 5. At the root of that folder, you want to have a global.json file that says always use .NET 5 in this tree. All, it doesn't matter what folder I'm in, I want, I want to use .NET 5. Then set up another folder uh, for the bleeding edge stuff and put a, a global.json in there for whatever versions you're going to use in there. That'll yeah, keep you yeah. safe. Indeed. And and this is all sandbox. This is all by itself. So, I mean, I, I pulled up my .NET SDK. As you can see, I have everything from 3.0 all the way to... I'm surprised that I actually don't have Preview 3. I, I was trying the MAUI bits for Preview 3. I don't apparently have .NET 6 Preview 3, but they all live in your uh, local directories and they are all uh, by themselves. They're isolated, so you absolutely can, yeah. I pasted um, that global.json uh, yep. uh, documentation in chat so you can look over how that works. Perfect. Perfect. Um, okay, so let me see if this would come up and work as we expect. So Visual Studio, my Visual Studio is also having a day off Tuesdays, but it looks like this one is okay. Okay, so this is straight up Blazor, right? So do what you need to do with your Blazor. The counter works, and this is all WebAssembly. This is all uh, client side. This is where Ed loves to ship hundreds and hundreds of megabytes and gigabytes of DLLs to the client side. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You gotta it's make that counter work somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. It's all good. It's nicely optimized, actually, and they're still working on it. Uh, so, so everything works. Yeah, go on. That counter works off of AI blockchain uh, augmented <laughs> reality. Oh, oh boy. And, and don't get started on like NFTs. That's a whole other thing that uh, we can, like old people can uh, complain about. That's I, I need to reach out to uh, Daniel Roth and get a have him get, take a screenshot of the counter component and NFT it. I think that belongs to him. Uh, that's funny. Um, but uh, since we did start uh, with checking off that thing in our uh, Visual Studio, you see that little thing here that says install. If I do that, essentially what's going to happen is it's just going to install uh, locally on my desktop, and it's going to give me a little icon that I can pin to my dock, and I can run it, and then you won't see the thing on the top. Like, you won't see the browser um, kind of chromium, the, the look and feel. It'll just run inside of a window. Now, keep in mind, there is no, like, magic. It is still running a web app, and if you don't have offline support, then you don't have offline support. It's not going to magically just uh, work. So that's where your service workers come in. Right, um, and I think uh, if I can look this up here, uh, we did a really nice thing with uh, with the PWA. Let me um, let me try to pull it up. So I'm going to go to Teleric, and I'm going to go to Blazor. I think we have it listed on the product page. Don't we um, demos. Uh, where is the PWA demo? Uh, this is this the stocks one? Is it right? Yeah, the um, I portfolio. think all of them. Oh, I'm not sure. Videos. Yeah, Blazing Coffee is. Uh, okay. I know the I stock portfolio is. Yeah. Um, not sure about the dashboard one, but I think they all are. 
Yeah. So when I run this, folks, like you, you see how it's running. This is a full on desktop app, but you see that little thing here. So you, I can install this. And mm -hmm. uh, again, if you do this on mobile, like if I if I shrink this down, like you, you get a nice responsive experience and you can pull this up on your mobile phone. And that this is a nice, easy way for you to have mobile support where you don't have to do anything. Now, keep in mind, like this is a progressive web app and I, I have some reservations against it. Uh, mostly because like there are limitations to some of the native APIs that you can call. But again, for forms over data, for like showing visualizations, if you are not needing some of the native API, like the hardcore things, this is fine. Uh, you're you're using the web as a delivery mechanism. You have you can add offline support to it, uh, and you can uh, you can have even, even have like push notifications if you have services in the cloud. Uh, and this is easy. You're, you don't have to do anything else, and you can give the user a very nice experience. People can pin this app to your home screen, to their home screens, and have a good experience, uh, even in offline mode. So, so and, I, know, I know this probably sounds silly, but on Windows, uh, they just did an update earlier this year that added the uninstall dialog to mm -hmm. the Windows OS. Uh, so on the on the PWA up in your uh, progress bar or not progress bar yep. your address bar do you see the little mm -hmm. download icon? Yeah. Um, on Windows that was the only way to uninstall the app uh, until this year they actually added it into the OS so it's like a native application and and it shows up in your your apps list to uninstall. So nice. these are nice. these are getting closer and closer to acting like native desktop applications. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, this is a little bit more nuanced, right, Ed? Because I mean, it's it's one thing to say, hey, I, I have a PWA, but to really cater to that mobile experience, you do need to kind of look into maybe the uh, the size of the screen, like you're talking about like mobile, like uh, some media queries here where you want to know what the size is that the user is running on yeah. resolution wise. So um, if you can go back to the, the main demos page, Sam, so we don't have this incorporated in any of our um, sample apps yet because this technically has, it's shipped in a, um, a mid uh, release. So it's, it's a minor release that we shipped this in. It's being announced for the next major release. So we haven't incorporated it into those apps yet. But if you scroll down to the, the new stuff here, uh, there is a media query Ooh, component yeah, I in here. I always like these like new little labels that tell you right away, yeah. like this is something new. So what this will do is it ah. will detect the screen size. So if you resize your browser, make note of that climate data in Santa Cruz um, section there. When, mm -hmm. when you go to a different screen size, it's going to reorient the image. Oh, yeah. It's going to remove that yeah. data table. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can you can show and hide components. Um, my favorite, though, it's not in this particular demo, but uh, when I was prototyping this idea out, um, the, the uh, concept was maybe I want to swap that data table with like a card list instead, mm -hmm. something that's more mobile friendly. So you can actually yep. do that very easily with this. Um, so when you're when you're scrolling, um, actually, if you can go to the code tab and look at the code for that. Um, the code for it is very easy to understand. Uh, you basically place a Telerik media query component on the page, and it gives you an event um, mm. for that that breakpoint. So when you hit uh, 480 pixels, it detects that uh, that is a small screen size, and See? it will flip uh, a bit um, on the page here. It's just a boolean flag that says, "Okay, this this detected a small screen." Uh, do what you want with that that if statement. It's as easy as that. Yeah, and we are naming things like extra small, small, medium, large, mm -hmm. and then where, where does the flip happen? Um, uh, it happens through data binding. So oh, if, I see. if you look, it's uh, the do, code do for this to, is actually uh, in line. Do you want to share your screen? Because like you might sure, be I can do that. better off uh, walking yep. through this. And also, like while you're doing that, oh, okay, you got it up already. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So if we go back to that same demo here, it's under the Blazor apps, uh, and then down under Media Query. Uh, if we if you source here, uh, what happens is on this screen size, uh, there's a breakpoint that's set. So when the browser gets um, 
reduced down to that size or it uh, initializes at that size, we're going to fire an onChange event that lets you do whatever you'd like. But we've actually inlined the code here just to make it as simple as possible. And we're going to take the value that we received from the event and just pass it right into the property on the page here. And we're going to say set extra small to whatever we received from the change event. So usually you're going to cross that on uh, um, when it turns true uh, or when you expand, it's going to flip it back. So we'll say extra small is true. And when that happens, we have an if statement here that says if extra small, then oh, show this yeah. block of code. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really that simple. So there, that's all the code to make that happen is here and here for extra small. Yeah. And you can use this for a lot of different things. Uh, like I said, you can, you can swap out different components completely if you'd like. So inside of this section of HTML, you could have a uh, card list. And then in your if or your elf statement, you could have uh, a full data grid for a, a large desktop device. Got it. Yeah, this is Very nice. flexible. Ed, go ahead and hide that little thing at the bottom that keeps Oh, a little me. stop sharing bit yeah. here. It's like, I know I'm sharing. <laughs> okay, so let, let me ask you this. Like, again, um, as, as a native dev, I, I don't know uh, enough about the web way of doing things. So let's say I have a Blazor, uh, just a vanilla Blazor app, right? And I'm looking to make that into a PWA. Maybe I started with the web, and now I want to reach the mobile form factors. So um, how do I get started um, doing some of the things that a PWA needs to be, like offline support? Like, are there docs that you can point to, like uh, on Blazor docs where they talk about this? Or like, how do I add the service workers? Um, I There is some documentation under, um, let me see, it's docs.microsoft.com. Um, we need to go over to ASP.NET, and it's going to be under the Blazor. Um, oh, actually, I have an even better resource. There, there is some documentation in here under um, the Blazor stuff on uh, PWAs, so progressive oh, web go. apps. Yeah. We'll go ahead and pop that in the chat. Um, there is well, maybe also... that, that is the, that is the link I had pulled up where they talked about like if you start from the project you can just check that checkbox or if mm -hmm. you have a blazer project you can still convert that into a PWA. Yeah, but you asked about offline support, so yeah. there's information here about offline oh, support. There it is. Uh, there is push notification. Uh, it tells you how to, and it's got a link where I was going to send you next. Uh, so it talks a little bit about push notifications, and then they have um, an actual example in their uh, Blazing Pizza workshop that is also really great to uh, get a sample application from. Can you, um, can you show us that? Yeah. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to pop this into a new window here. Uh, let's see. This went directly to the push notification section of it, so it gives you all of the code. Oh, there you it is. Need, yeah. uh, there is some JavaScript that is needed for this because the um, service workers are outside of the Blazor uh, uh, application framework. So they're, they're not running in the context of Blazor as much as they are just a native web thing. So yeah. they are written in JavaScript. So, so you need to subscribe. Yeah. yeah. You can subscribe to the push notifications. Uh, mm -hmm. It will ask for user permission and all of that. And then they show you how to send through, I think it's an Azure service, uh, a push yeah. notification to the device. And you can pop that up in the native UI of Windows. Nice. So uh, yeah, that think, is really cool. Yeah, I think push is kind of an advanced uh, way or advanced okay. thing you want to do to a PWA, but I think offline support is kind of an easy way we are just using uh, the stories that the browser gives you anyways, just to kind of read and write from it. Mm -hmm. So and then, yeah. uh, I see the offline support right there, yeah. Yeah, offline support is, um, it's helpful, and there's some things that you can do along with offline support. So if you're offline, you're probably going to need to save data somewhere on that device uh, because you're now disconnected 
from the yeah. cloud and there's no way to, to persist anything. So I think, there, um, yeah, so the, see that local storage thing? I think the to-do list app actually does write to local storage. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you can read and write off the local storage when you're adding to-do lists. Yeah, items. so yeah. for local storage, um, if you're gonna be doing any local storage, I highly suggest a NuGet package um, called Blazored, B-L-A-Z-O-R-E-D, uh, local storage. And this gives you a nice, easy API service. Uh, the local storage stuff, you could write JavaScript interop really easy to get that done, but this is even more elegant and it's already written for you, so why write it again? Yeah. Uh, so Blazor oh, Local it's, it's Storage. Chris, Chris Santi, huh? Yeah, Chris Santi, Microsoft MVP, Blazor Expert. Um, you basically register a service after you install the NuGet package, and then you get an API that's uh, very similar to the way um, HTTP client works, except you're doing this on local storage. So you call, um, let's see, here it is. Uh, you call set item async. Mm -hmm. And you can do uh, strongly typed uh, get back from it. So you can say um, get item async and you say what type you had stashed away. This could be uh, a POCO object. So you can have yeah. uh, some state in here. You can get that data right back out uh, by the, the key that you set that to. So this, this get and set is very much uh, like a JSON, like post and fetch um, yeah. or yeah, get from get from JSON async. Uh, so the API is very familiar if you use this. Um, we use this on our Blazing Coffee app, which I could pull that up and you can actually see some real world code using this. So in Blazing Coffee on the index page, um, let's go to the running app that's on the web. I like your Visual Studio Code theme. Thank you. This is our <laughs> Code It Live theme. We'll pull that back up in a sec. This um, drag and drop behavior here, this is our, our Blazor tile layout uh, component. Um, this will actually save in local storage the uh, positions of these items. So when you come back to the application, uh, this is custom to the, you know, your, your design that you left these at. So the way we do that is with that Blazor local storage. And this is the uh, Code at Live theme Sam was talking about in Visual Studio Code, which you can get very easily by just oh, typing. as well, because I, I posted a big link as well. Oh, here you go. You can, you can <laughs> yeah. also go to this tab and just type Code at Live in yeah, the yeah. box and it will show up as well. Uh, but the local storage bits, what we're doing um, is we, we have a function called save state, which is called every time you drag one of the tiles, right? So I'm gonna go on my Blazing Coffee app and drag a tile, uh, not the image, but the tile over. That save state gets triggered. And it says, go ahead and set the item async on local storage, and it's called index layout. Then I'm gonna grab my tile layout component and grab the state from it. So this is a Telerik uh, API. And what it does is it, it gets the complete state of that tile layout component from the component and uh, it gives it back to you as uh, an object which uh, the blazer local storage turns into a JSON response and sends to local storage to be saved. And then when you revisit the page and it re-renders, uh, we just go back out and get the tile component again and set the state from local storage back into the component. And it's just that easy. It's just really yeah. uh, these three lines of code here. So you set the state, you get it, and you rehydrate it. And yeah. uh, that sets your, your view back to the way the user left it. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is there's, there's quite a bit of help. Um, so if you wanted to build a PWA, then you have a PWA builder, which gives you the manifest file if you don't have one. You can create your own icons. You can create your own like manifest file by hand if you wanted to, but there's help. And then it's easy, fairly easy to add offline support with that NuGet package and then push notifications. It's a little bit more involved, but I mean, there's nothing um, difficult about it. There's like step-by-step -step documentation on, on enabling that if you want. So, 
So if, if I have a Greenfield uh, web app today, Ed, uh, mm -hmm. what is your preferred way of adding mobile support? Because like gone are the days where we are doing like CSS hacks to kind of read the media query sizes and then cater like different views for mobile. Like you, you don't recommend that anymore, do you? Um, you still need media queries. Media queries are actually pretty modern. Uh, you're, what you're probably going to want to do if you're kind of new to CSS, you still might want to go ahead and grab something like Bootstrap. Bootstrap's yeah. not uh, bad, uh, especially if you're doing something like the hackathon um, and you know, you're, tr you're prototyping, you need to build stuff really quickly. Uh, Bootstrap's actually pretty, pretty fantastic for that type of thing. Uh, building something very fast, uh, prototyping it out and uh, having that wireframe type of behavior is really good. Um, another one that folks like um, is uh, Tailwind. Uh, so Tailwind has some uh, layout behaviors. Um, I'm not particularly mm, familiar I have with not used this. how to use this, but I've heard really good things about um, the way it does uh, the, uh, layouts with Flexbox and CSS Grid under the hood. So this, this is probably a little bit um, closer to a native CSS experience than, than Bootstrap is. Uh, and then Ancient Coder is asking, has anyone, anyone's a pretty pretty wide term. I'm sure somebody's using it. Um, I, I, I have use, not, but uh, yeah, yeah. But look, this looks good. I haven't used it personally, but I've heard really good things about uh, the layout uh, behaviors of it. I personally know a lot about CSS, so I would probably avoid this as well um, and just use CSS Grid. And if you go to CSS Tricks, um, I'll post this in chat as well. This is one of my favorite links. Um, there is CSS Flexbox. This is an amazing guide to Flexbox. So this will take care of about 50% of your, your layout needs. Um, it's very mobile friendly because of the way it reflows items uh, here's here's a good example of it. It's very graphical, this whole uh, cheat sheet. So this is uh, the same as a stack panel in uh, WinForms or WPF. Uh, yes, so now you're talking you can, my language. <laughs> so this is your this is your stack panel. You can yeah. you can go uh, flex uh, horizontally, which they call um, by row, or you can flex column. So you can go up, down, down, up. Uh, so this is a very easy way to lay out your pages and do card layouts and, and uh, uh, what are those things called? Masonry style layouts. And then they also have a good guide in here. I'm try to find this with, uh, let's see if I can do a search. CSS grid. Here we go, complete guide to CSS grid. So I love CSS tricks. They have just fantastic mm, resources yeah. here. Uh, so CSS Grid, a little bit more involved than Flexbox, but this is essentially your your grid in WinForms or WPF. Um, not a data grid, but a layout grid. And you can do literally any type of layout with grid. So those frameworks that I just mentioned, if you're good with CSS, you do not need them at all. This will take care of any type of layout that you need. Uh, you put a couple media queries in there for some breakpoints you have, and you can uh, move these grids around uh, as you need them. And uh, there's some pretty cool resources here too. Uh, you can get these cheat sheets to hang up in your office and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know uh, Alyssa's a big fan of these. She's got some of them, uh, but you know, fantastic resource here and probably the more advanced way to go, but also the closest uh, you know, uh, you're going to get to the hardware on uh, yeah. writing those out versus using a, a framework like uh, Bootstrap or uh, uh, Tailwind. Uh, Bootstrap's going to give you probably the most um, documentation. So it's been around a long time. So there's probably a whole lot of blogs and examples on how to do different types of layouts and things. Um, and then, of course, inside of the Telerik components, we have some stuff too. Um, that um, tile layout component I showed can do more than just a simple menu like that. 
So if we go over to I'm trying to remember how we organized this, there is uh, let's see too many components. Tile layout is under light. Oh, cool. of course, layout where it belongs. Um, our tile layout component uh, uses a, a CSS grid underneath the hood, but it gives you these drag and drop type of features mm -hmm. uh, that you don't get out of the box with uh, CSS grid. So this is a really nice route to go as well. And uh, you, can, you can add those media query components and things in here uh, to make these uh, work on mobile too. Yeah, and I mean, you, you, you and me come from the .NET background, so we talked about all things Blazor, but like Tailwind and um, CSS Grid, I mean, Flexbox, these are things you can use for Angular and React as well, any any spot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think uh, that that's all the roundup of things I can think of where you can bring in web stuff to work nicely on mobile. Is there anything else you can think of? Um, this is another nice component. The drawer component is really uh, a great one for mobile because you can hide more complex menus yeah. uh, behind a hey, hamburger the, icon. The hamburger menu never went away from mobile. It never went and away. It's a good event. It never went away. It's also, um, it's got uh, a couple different states here. Let's see if I can get it. Yeah, it has this overlay state that's nice. It'll It'll kind of gray out the uh, UI while you uh, yeah. pick your menus and notice this one hides completely off screen. So you do, you basically wrap the drawer around your entire app and then it will push over the top of your application. Uh, yeah. Very easy to set up and uh, gives you a nice way to uh, implement uh, larger menus without uh, putting a whole lot of CSS or JavaScript or anything in your application. You just put one component on your your application and, and that's it you're done you're ready to go on to the next thing uh, so it makes you super productive and uh, you can use the media query component um, in tandem with this as well uh, so one of the things I've done in the past with this is uh, changed uh, this to like if you're on mobile um, I have changed the width of it so the menu just takes up the full screen while it's on mobile so that's kind of a, a little idea that's fun to, to work with as well. So you don't get this this gray bar down the side. You can mm -hmm. actually get the full menu on across the screen. Remember to put a close button on there though, in case you don't want to pick one of the options. <laughs> uh, so that's a little bit more of an advanced tip, but uh, you, can, you can be creative with this thing as well. Um, and then of course, one last thing, Sam, is all of the Telerik UI components are completely customizable through uh, themebuilder.telerik.com. Uh, actually, this goes for all of our UI components, not just Blazor, but uh, Kendo UI as well. Um, so when you say all, again, you were uh, you were asking ancient coder if all meant it was a broad term. You are excluding me. I mean, I can't do some of the native stuff with it, but I, I'll give it to you. This is all web stuff and it's fun. All the stuff that really matters. <laughs> All, right, all the all web right. components. Uh, no, all the actually all the the uh, components are themeable, but not through Theme Builder. Exactly, uh, because those are so... native, and we don't want to do a web play over something that is native. Uh, yeah. In, in fact, uh, there there in, uh, we have a WPF app, which is a theme builder, which lets you mm -hmm. choose anything from WinForms or WPF. Just start with the theme, customize it, and then we uh, when you save it, it's just saving a bunch of XAML uh, styles, which you can use uh, anywhere. Um, so we do let you customize. We just don't want to put a shim web shim over something that is already native, which mm -hmm. is how the world runs, Ed. But anyways. Yep. <laughs> so if you're using um, like Angular, for example, uh, this works for Blazor as well. You just go to start theming. Uh, you pick your base theme. Do you, if you're using Bootstrap, like I suggested earlier, if you're like rapid prototyping, um, you're using Bootstrap, and you're especially if you can, um, if you have somebody on your team that uses SAS and they know how to install the Bootstrap theme for SAS, uh, the SAS theme for Bootstrap, um, you can use our Bootstrap theme and it will automatically uh, style all of the Bootstrap that you use as well. If you use any of the Bootstrap stuff, um, this will uh, patch in the color styles uh, with the ones that you set in Theme Builder. Uh, so you can take all of the components here, hit create, 
and now you've got a uh, what you see is what you get style um, editor, which I don't know if I've got a little bit of a delay here. There it goes. Um, you can take your color palette or you can just grab a color swatch even and you can grab something like this indigo theme and then when you make those changes this UI will update with all of the colors applied to it and once it does that I've got a little bit of lag on my end because of the stream I think uh, so just that easy like rethemed all of not only the bootstrap components but all of the kendo UI components as well and then you can hit download uh, you name this and it gives you two files. It gives you a CSS and a SAS uh, themes file. And if you're using CSS, you just plop the CSS file in your app and all of the components, uh, the Teller components are rethemed. If you're using SAS, you put the variables in your application and both uh, Kendo UI and Bootstrap get the new theme. So a very powerful tool to customize your app in set it apart from others in the hackathon indeed indeed so let me uh let me see if i can post here i think i have it in my um in my clipboard so that's the hackathon um home folks and i kind of wish i i could participate because the prices are really sweet uh, but i mean ed, ed, ed if you don't mind just putting that uh, link up one more time um so look at the prices like we are doing it per category like per UI framework that you might want to use. So if you want to use Blazor, if you want to use React or Angular, and then today, hopefully, uh, we give you enough ammunition for that thing on the right hand side, the best mobile support. It's not so difficult. And, and we are not um, asking for the most polished thing, because I mean, um, it, it takes work to get a really nice mobile experience. But you can mm -hmm. start, you can take those baby steps. Um, so uh, let's just kind of recap what we talked about. If you are using Blazor, right, then you have, uh, again, experimental still, but you can do Blazor natively on iOS and Android. You can do that. Just bring over and you're rendering uh, native components through Blazor markup. Or you can do Blazor hybrid where you are rendering everything as is, as you would do for a Blazor app, just inside of a web view. And again, both of them uh, are experimental, but you can do that for the hackathon. And then if you really want to keep your app just web, then consider making it a PWA. Consider at least giving it some mobile support with some of the media queries, with some CSS uh, grids, whatever you might want to do to add some of the pages and the experience as one is kind of navigating through your app. And um, there's a lot of help. Absolutely. Yeah. Um... Another thing that, that helps uh, with the mobile uh, aspect of your application is anytime you're mobile, you're, you're going to be getting uh, your data from somewhere. Uh, if you're going to be getting data, then uh, using Fiddler with your application uh, is a safe, very safe bet. So you can, you can try to tackle two things at once here. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure that you're using Fiddler with your development of your application. What Fiddler does is it, it uh, allows you to inspect HTTP traffic. So and HTTPS traffic. Yes. So if you're building your, your mobile application and you have a web service, uh, and maybe you, you created a, uh, a Git request that isn't pulling back data or the right data, you can pull up Fiddler and see uh, what type of traffic is actually going across the wire. Maybe you're missing, uh, you know, you, you thought you set some parameters on your Git request and they're, they're not in the body of the message you're sending. Uh, and that's why you're not getting back the right data. You can find all of that through Fiddler. Um, so make sure you check so, out Fiddler everywhere. I, I, I did post a link. So Fiddler has, uh, it's it's a broad family of products. Now there is Fiddler Classic, which is the one that you're used to on Windows, but there's Fiddler Everywhere, which is rewritten, works on Mac, works on Linux and Windows, mm -hmm. but there's also Fiddler Cap, Fiddler Jam. It's like a whole set of products, but uh, to Ed's point, yes, it lets you look into network traffic, but the best part of Fiddler is, I mean, DevTools will let you on Chrome, like look into network traffic, but it's uh, it's the other things that Fiddler does, like recording traffic and playing it right back at you so you can kind of fake having a service um, and looking into HTTPS, being able to capture what's going across the wire and, and, and so on. So 
um, you got a lot of help with Fiddler while you're doing we're, while you're building this. Yeah. We're gonna try one more thing here. Uh oh. All right. Cross your fingers. I have an okay. this in, in just a little bit. Um, so this is one more category that we'll throw at you before we go. Uh, the best use of Teller Test Studio is another great one you can look at while you're doing um, web mobile. So uh, responsive web and all of that. Um, you can actually test your, uh, your application um, like an end-to-end -end test. So integration test. Uh, and this is some really cool stuff. I need to run a couple projects here real quick to get this working. But essentially, let's see if I can uh, get this going right. Ah, there we go, PowerShell. Um, this is the uh, prototype for what ended up being the media query in uh, the Teller UI components. So if I go into my application here and I have a .NET uh, 3 app that I need to run, I need to test multiple application uh, frameworks and um, I could do multiple browsers and everything. So I'm going to do .NET run on this one. Your CLI tool is like too small to read, but that's it fine. It's too small. Oh, this is, we had a question about uh, different versions of uh, Blazor or different versions of .NET and uh, using them safely on the same machine. Uh, this is one of those places I need to put a global.json file. So you can see here, I have program files, uh, blah, blah, blah. 6.0 preview three uh, is the current target and it's trying to do something with the project that's on .NET 5 and it's failing, or .NET 3 rather, and it's failing. So um, don't know if this is gonna be a workable example right now because I got to go drop a couple oh, of that's all right. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing all of these shows, here. so maybe yeah, maybe you can come back on next uh, next show and show off Test Studio because like you you went a little beyond just mobile support because like we already talked about doing stuff on Fiddler and um, let me let me drop this link again here. Um, so these are all the shows that are coming up, folks. So. Um, Maybe you can join Alyssa or me uh, coming up on one of the shows and talk about Test Studio. Which uh, which um, link did you just share, Sam? So I could pull it up here. Uh, just the last one on uh, on the link uh, in, in the Q and A. Yeah, I can't uh, click on the. Oh, there. I see. Pop it in private chat. Yeah. Okay. Or you could share your screen. Either one. No, that's fine. Here. Uh, it's in private chat. And uh, while you're doing that, let me see. Uh, <laughs> Time Bender 360. Shouldn't VS 2019 just give us options to select an SDK? Mm. It will give you an uh, option to select the SDK for Visual Studio. Uh, so it will. Uh, this is the wrong have, time. Yeah, this is. At build time, or at, yeah, at build time when I'm doing um, development, it's using .NET Standard 2.0 uh, for Rosalyn uh, for the um, just to make sure the app compiles. But when I build it from the command line, it's using a different tool chain. Uh, I could probably do. Let's try Control F5 here. Let's see if I hit the same thing. Okay, so there's my application running in the browser. My my port is going to be different than what I have my test set up for, but I can easily fix that. Uh, so what we could do is come into my .NET 5 test suite, and I need to set. Uh, let's let's try to run this and see if it picks anything up here. Yeah, it's checking the wrong port, so it's not gonna work. So I have the port configured to um, the CLI. 
So I can't, I'm not going to be able to get it to run until I go back and fix those, uh, those build problems. But essentially what Test Studio will do is load my app in the browser and it will uh, automatically go through this and run uh, all the tests that I have um, on the sample pages. And it will inspect different values on each page to ensure that, uh, for example, if I resize this page, um, Test Studio will come through and actually resize this for me and test to make sure that the correct element is lit up with the blue uh, marker on it to make sure that my media queries are firing uh, appropriately. So I can hands off just test drive this entire app. Um, I can come into Test Studio. Uh, I can pull up my list of tests and I can run all of the tests in those lists just at the click of a button and get a report back whether they passed or failed. Um, these are something that you can use in tandem with unit tests and um, you can test things that you might not catch in unit testing. So we're, we're deeply integrated with the browser at that point. So if there's a browser quirk uh, you, that maybe something in Edge doesn't work in uh, Chrome, which is a little bit rare these days, but it could still happen. You would catch stuff like that uh, with Test Studio, so there there's an opportunity there as well. Yeah, this was good. So we started from um, trying to add mobile support, so that's a big category, uh, and it's fairly easy. It's a it's a low hanging fruit to start adding some of the mobile support uh, for the hackathon, and um, yeah, you can take as uh, advanced steps as you can with CSS grids, with Flexbox, with uh, service workers for a PWA. So do what you can, and, and we are here to help. Um, I have my Twitter handle, and Ed is trying to hide, but that's his Twitter handle, essentially just smashes It's my name, name anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're famous. It's an, it's an easy name to find. Yeah. Just Google the last name, and I will be there. <laughs> yeah, so we are here to help, folks. Uh, I kind of wish I could participate, but uh, yeah, build your apps. You still got um, more than a month left uh, to build your app and make a pitch. So mm -hmm. again, we are here to help. Uh, there's a lot of resources to help. Uh, Ancient Coder, thanks for hanging out. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. So thanks for hanging out, folks. Uh, we're going to hand you over to Fritz. I, th I think he's still working on TikTok and uh, so C Sharp and Blazor stuff. So go hang out with him. And uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, folks. We'll see you soon.